great flood of the Bible, an event so immense it is outright scorned as myth, not except it is only a localized event. But did it really happen? And can we know for certain with all the data available today? No generation has had public access to the detail that we now enjoy. With advances in cameras and satellite technology, the entire Earth can be viewed like never before. If we thoroughly investigate all clues, can we uncover evidence of this global catastrophe? In professional detective work, there's no room for illogical leaps. Honed reasoning and an eye for detail must collect, examine, analyze, and report the evidence correctly. By asking the right questions and thoroughly running all search patterns, the scene will yield many facts. But does the Earth bear direct evidence of this great flood? Can we dispense with the circumstantial evidence that relies on inference? and find the genuine data that should hold up in any court? With today's database of knowledge, this case should be self-evident as genuine or not. So what are we dealing with, and why do so many have difficulty accepting this account as fact? The Earth is a vast sphere with a surface area of just over 510 million square kilometers. And according to the U.S. Geologic Survey, the total amount of water on planet Earth is 1,386,000,000 kilometers. This means that if the Earth's surface were perfectly flat, without any hills and valleys whatsoever, it would be completely covered with water to a depth of 2.6 kilometers, or more than 8,500 feet. Earth truly is a beautiful blue marble. Starting with evidence collection, we find the claimed incident of the global flood in the Bible. Here, there is enough framework to conclusively deduce that this event had to be a geological one. Yet the scriptures themselves were undeniably written long after the event. This makes any human element hearsay, and strictly speaking, circumstantial evidence at best. But is this inspiration of scripture genuinely visible in the evidence? Can we see the God-breathed truth preserved as an actual event? Now this is a fair question. On the account of a total global flood, is the inspiration of Almighty God genuine? Or is this just an allegory, a story for children, or a legend handed down from long ago? If the forensics of the earth match this as a fact, then God-breathed inspiration can be trusted. The geologic points we can draw from scripture are as follows. In Genesis 1-6, Earth has a firmament or expanse. Here, we can only logically conclude that atmospherics exist and nothing more. There's no need for imagining a non-scientific canopied Earth. There's no direct evidence for such. Atmospherics control all weather patterns. In Genesis 1-9, it testifies that waters were once gathered to one place with a dry land distinction. This testifies that a single gigantic ocean of a single unified land mass once existed. This implies that at one time all the continents were joined, surrounded by a great ocean, whereas today we have seven continents and five great oceans. In Genesis 7-4, we have the testimony that prior to flooding, great rain came at the forefront of the actual flooding itself, and this lasted for 40 days and nights. Verses 6 to 10 declare that floodwaters came on the earth distinct from the rain. This is the logical known order of hurricanes and tropical storms that bring tidal waves. The wind and rain come first at the forefront of the generating storm. In Genesis 7:11, we have the testimony of fountains or springs of the great deep. It says these burst forth or were broken up. Now the biggest thing we can take from this testimony is first that the original gigantic ocean was called the Great Deep. This speaks of an immense size and is the one place that Genesis 1-9 said the waters were gathered to, leaving behind a unified single supercontinent. So our first question is, 
Was it this great deep that broke up, or fountains that burst forth that caused the great flood according to the scriptural testimony? Many believers today adhere to a hydroplate theory, which suggests that there were springs deep under Earth's crust. Due to immense pressure, these burst open. Yet this appears to be just circumstantial suggestion. The scientists have produced 3D models that show big bodies of water under Earth's mantle, but these are only squeezed into specific locations. The hydroplate theory reaches a scientific dead end. So what is the text saying? The Hebrew word for fountain or spring in this text is mayan. Here it is used in the denominative transitive sense, meaning it is only a descriptive byproduct of the breaking open of the great deep. This is like describing an atomic bomb's explosion as a mushroom. It is not a genuine mushroom, but something unique created as a result. The fountains or springs, according to this testimony, are byproducts of the great deep bursting forth. So, a modern description of these fountains would be that tsunamis burst forth. In Genesis 7:18, it testifies that these waters prevailed and greatly increased upon the earth. This implies that this once immense ocean ruled over the land. Then verse 19 says the waters rose and even covered the high mountains. So if this event is genuine, this investigation has to find a source to account for this prevailing. Genesis 7.24 states the waters flooded the earth for 150 days, which gives us an even greater force to find. When the event describes water overtaking all land and continuing to do so for this period of time. Genesis 8.1 says a great wind went over the earth and then the waters began receding. And 8.5 states that waters receded another two and a half months before the mountain tops became visible. And chapter 8 continues that it was yet another few more months before the surface of ground was dry. And the whole ordeal took just over a year from start to finish. This declares the turn of events and the limits of force that this investigation would need to reveal in order to maintain the integrity as genuine fact. Now, Jeremiah 4 and 24 mentions that mountains trembled and hills moved back and forth. This is clearly a geologic event, but it would have to be a major geologic catastrophe that could, in the process, cause the waters of a once gigantic ocean to slosh or ride over dry land. For the time described, this investigation would need to find evidence for this trembling around the planet simultaneously. Psalm 104 verse 9 is also clear about a boundary that prevents such from ever being repeated. So it is no illogical leap that, with the current configuration of the Earth, that a similar flood event can never happen at the same scale. This claims there is direct evidence on our planet in its configuration. And so, for our investigation, we can surmise that the configuration itself played a part of the event. Isaiah 54 and 9 also confirms testimony that such a flood could no longer cover the earth. And if such is true, in Earth's configuration, the God-breathed inspiration would be preserved, as this was recorded well before the mapping we now enjoy and prior to geophysics as a field of study. To find the actual fingerprints of the flood, if we draw from the testimony correctly, we are looking for a global geologic event in a world that once had a vast ocean called the Great Deep with a single unified continental configuration that broke apart as hills and mountains moved and the vast ocean water rode over the dry land. That this geologic separation was so forceful it caused ocean water to slosh around the globe for many months before it began abating. And that that abating was preceded by a vast wind and all the forces at play were still active enough that it took another several months for the waters to entirely abate. When we consider the direct evidence left behind by geologic events of the past, something of this great flood's magnitude must have left direct evidence on our planet if it is a genuine account. So, to gather direct tangible evidence of our planet, let's start with today's geologic understanding. Although map makers going back to the 16th century had cited a possible connection across the Atlantic, it wasn't until 1858 when a theologian named Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, in his book Creation and Its Mysteries Unveiled, showed images that South America fit across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa. Here he cited the Great Flood of the Bible as the cause for breakup, but there's no direct evidence to be found here. 
Then in 1912, a German geologist named Alfred Wagner was the first to claim the phrases Pangaea and Continental Drift. He was ridiculed by the geologists of his time for not citing a motivational source. He made several expeditions to Greenland determined to prove his point. And on his last expedition, funded by the German government, Wagner was lost in a snowstorm and perished. He was, however, the first to start drilling for ice core samples. From the mid-1920s into the 50s, with the use of new side-scan sonar, the land masses underneath the ocean waves were being discovered. In 1955, Marie Tharp was the first to compile an accurate sketch of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This led to mapping the entire globe's ridges, which appear to wrap around our planet like the stitching of a baseball. This is when the notion of tectonic plates began. Then in 1958, while researching the Van Allen radiation belts, James Van Allen himself discovered an unusual magnetic anomaly on planet Earth. It was the size of a continent. This region was an ultra-low magnetic field, which permitted charged particles from space to reach deep within Earth's atmosphere. This region was dubbed the South Atlantic Anomaly, and for a long time, as it was only thought to be a magnetic question, no one in geology paid this area much attention. Then in 1961, Rear Admiral Harry Hess and geology professor Robert S. Dietz confirmed the seafloor was spreading. Science crowned this discovery as the motivational force for continental separation and plate tectonics was born. Alfred Wegner's Pangaea model now became scientifically accepted with the motivational force for separation. As the rates of seafloor spread were confirmed, this became the accepted measuring stick for deep geologic time based upon the Pangaea model. It was by this rate of spread and its presupposed origin that all layers of sediment are dated right up to today. So, whenever a scientist claims a prehistoric date for a crustal layer, they are basing it on the rate of spread at boundary lines as a constant, using the assumed Pangaea separation model. It does virtually appear to fit, but there is only the hypothesis for the constant spread. So, it is due to the Pangaea model that many in the scientific community ridicule traditional beliefs as fallacy. And the record shows Professor Dietz led the way. He showed utter disdain for a creation account and he seriously mocked the global flood as a myth. But does the Pangaea model truly hold up to thorough investigation? For 55 years, plate tectonics has flaunted its position as scientific fact, yet the Pangaea model of east-west separation across the Atlantic has always been an untested assumption. This makes the Pangaea model itself hearsay or circumstantial. Regardless of the reality of C4 spread today, it doesn't preclude such as a constant in the past. The rates that spread around the entire globe continue to pour in, and the more evidence that arrives, the less credible the Pangaea model becomes. Yet many past and even future configurations have been postulated, still without proving the east-west separation across the Atlantic. Although ridges do spread, the east-west origin has always been a visual assumption without any genuine scientific validation. Then, in the 1990s, with the ROSAT missions, as satellite numbers were increasing, problems with cosmic rays reaching lower into Earth's atmosphere began mandating power down or no-fly zones. In regions of Earth's magnetic anomalies, expensive equipment was being fried by cosmic radiation. At this time, NASA publicly declared of Earth's largest magnetic anomaly, the South Atlantic Anomaly, that its geologic origin was yet unknown. So, perhaps this is an area to investigate to find direct evidence for our global catastrophe. Now, top scientific facilities around the globe worked hard to produce better, more useful magnetic anomaly maps of the Earth. These are for the use of sea and air navigation, and also flight paths in Earth's orbit. By 2007, the European CCGM released its leading magnetic anomaly map of the world. It is scanned at over 12,000 nanotesla units, and its precision yields a view never before available. Perhaps this map functions like an MRI scan. Considering that satellites have mapped the Earth's surface detail at greater resolution than any in history, can we combine the CCGM's magnetic anomaly map with today's detail and put the Pangaea model to the true test? 
So I took a high resolution image of Earth's surface and cut it based upon the magnetic anomaly map into 2,648 distinguishable pieces and then animated the motion based upon all the data to date. With the vast increase in direct scientific data, it now appears that the Pangea model that plate tectonics has been founded on is simply too two-dimensional. The current model claims convections from deep within the Earth as the generating force, and then the disappearance of mass under subduction zones. Yet there is no deep mantle sources at the boundary lines, and not enough subduction zones to account for the Pangea model's origin. Also, the east-west across the Atlantic Ocean doesn't match proper flow on a true sphere. The model was always an assumed fit. So, the pursuit for a more robust explanation is required. The new lens must account for all the scientific data revealed to date, including magnetic anomalies. The boundary types are in, and clearly mark the direction of their motion. All plateaus, peaks, and masses under the ocean waves are mapped. Transform boundaries slip from each other in one direction or another, and I see this as the foremost sign of directional stress. Instead of the divergent boundaries plate tectonics uses that show their rise and outward spread. There are also convergent boundaries that meet and one slides under the other, or is landmass riding over, or perhaps a portion of either. This needs to be incorporated correctly. We also have to consider the direction of fault lines, and even all Earth's rifts, but thankfully these are mapped. We have the spread rates at boundary lines mapped, and even the directional flow of all surface crusts on the planet available. And if we throw in all the volcanic hot spots and even the known reverse faults with their overthrust at subduction zones, a completely different model of continental origins emerges. Now I know this all sounds a bit confusing, but it is easily deciphered. If we see that plate tectonics has hit the wall with the South Atlantic anomaly, the Pangea model that plate tectonics has so founded its position on is simply 2-2-D and inadequate to explain this vast anomaly. According to plate tectonics, the South Atlantic anomaly shouldn't be there, but it is. Now this leads to our direct evidence examination. Evidence collection has led this investigation to surmise that the complete east-to-west separation across the Atlantic in the Plangea model of plate tectonics simply could not have happened. It was only postulated before any undersea mapping and data gathered in the last 50 years. What I see as the main fingerprint on planet Earth is the US-UK World Magnetic Model's main field total intensity map. And to simplify this and develop an investigative hypothesis, this appears to have four corners of the Earth, so to speak, marked clearly by these loops. Now three of these spots are extra dense, marked by the highest values. And the one, the South Atlantic Anomaly, is marked by an ultra-low value. To simply argue that the South Atlantic Anomaly is due to a tilt in the Van Allen radiation belts doesn't give any geologic origin or account for why there are three high spots. Plus, the inner Van Allen belt is plainly mapped and consistent across specific latitudes. The most plausible answer is that the three dense regions are piled up displaced land masses, and the lowest region, the South Atlantic Anomaly, is missing land that once was rooted there, and the magnetic signatures still remain and allow us to retrace the continental origins properly. Starting with the heart of the South Atlantic Anomaly, using the higher resolution magnetic anomaly map of the world as our guide, we have these particular markings that perfectly cradle a high resolution collage of satellite images of Antarctica. Is this coincidental, or did Antarctica once reside here? Let's investigate the surrounding area here a little closer. Upon close investigation, the Filchner Trough fits over the north of South Georgia Island, and the Leopold Coast of Antarctica appears it once rode over the landmass South Georgia sits on. Revealed by the MODIS satellite, the thin land shelf currently under ice that makes up the Rhone Shelf appears to be combed like flowing lava. If it is simply scoured from flowing ice, there will be no visible land connections. 
But Berkner Island, that also cradles to South Georgia, has four unique notches, and these notches have visible corresponding flow zones. But in order for these flow zones to perfectly fit, the Rhone shelf at one time would have had to be completely closed, and then violently exploded open. And this is precisely what the magnetic anomaly map of the world implies here. These stretch marks imply a rapid explosion and a sequential tear. While in this location, if we remove the Rhone shelf for a moment to see what is underneath, we see the East Scotia Ridge, the South Sandwich Islands, and the Deep South Sandwich Trench. And moving south from here, continuing down to Antarctica's tip, we see the Orville and Lassiter coasts perfectly match the southerly edges of the Scotia Plate. More than this, even the seam on the Rhone Shelf flows in sync with the boundary of the East Scotia Ridge, and every little piece of the Rhone has a corresponding match on the surface of the Scotia Plate. It truly appears that the South Sandwich Trench was carved out like a chisel upon exit. There's definitely more matching points than any fingerprint. And just as fingerprinting yielded to DNA superiority in analysis, so also must any model of continental origins yield to the magnetic anomaly signatures. Upon further investigation, it becomes clearer that the entire Liverpool coast once rested and rolled from this hollow below the Falkland Fracture Zone. With the Maurice Ewing Bank rising up the Caird Coast of Antarctica, and the South Georgia Rise was swept out of Coachland. It was the foundation for Berkner Island, which was right here. When we close this all up, as the direct evidence indicates, the initial volcanic explosions began at Shackleton Range and continued in a cascading fashion right until it tore open Antarctica's tip, pouring out immense mounts of lava into what would become the Scotia Plate. Which doesn't appear to be a tectonic plate as much as a giant lithospheric tear. Think of it like getting a hole in a fitted sock that continued to enlarge. The more we investigate, the more it becomes obvious that the Falkland Islands with its mass and the most southerly end of South America, Tierra del Fuego, also messes up and onto the Caird Coast, and we can also bring in the tip of Antarctica perfectly sealing up the Scotia Plate to how it was prior to its massive explosion. The direct evidence on the surface of the Earth bears this as fact, but the impact of such a cataclysm would have a major cascade of effects around the entire planet. All the evidence here perfectly fits, but only while in motion, not slow and static like plate tectonics imagines, but rapid cataclysmic movement, flowing in harmony over the surface of a true sphere. Remember, our investigation has to include the geologic origin for the South Atlantic Anomaly, and this appears to be it. So as we continue examining the direct evidence, we are able to perfectly see this entire coast of Antarctica to South America, showing that the whole Argentine Sea was the result of Antarctica stretching away. As we make Tierra del Fuego to Antarctica, the most visible point of connection is the precise inset of Gunnera's Bank into Buenos Aires. This fit is undeniable. Also, these deep scour marks called the Rio Grande Gap perfectly match the Scott and Napier Mountains of Antarctica. This gives us clear marking points of origins and order, and we can then tell how the Santos Plateau toppled away in the process. Its directional pull appears like a collapsed pile of bricks. This reveals that the state of Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro once cradled around this Antarctic corner. Also, the Jasher and surrounding seamounts show synchronous flow coming out of Antarctica's Lars Christensen coast, which also shows similar lava flow to the Rhone Shelf. And the most incriminating mark on the surface of the Earth in this region that declares the speed of this event is the Bromley Plateau with its deep scour marks through the Rio Grande rise to the Hunter Gap. These marks are caused by the dragging out of Gunnerus Bank. As Antarctica was rapidly torn from South America, we can see its flight path in motion. And to top this region off, the entire stretch marks are recorded in the magnetic anomaly map signature. The direct evidence is undeniable that this is the geologic origin for the South Atlantic anomaly. 
and in this original position, the east-west separation of the Pangaea model is impossibly obstructed, revealing it has always been fallacy. Now this leads to what I know is the smoking gun that links the explosion of the Scotia Plate to a single global event. On the other side of Antarctica, we have the Ross Shelf, which also carries the same volcanic combing. Here, for more than 1,000 kilometers, we have a precise fit with this southerly region of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. With a clear 1,000 kilometers, this cannot be coincidence. Further investigation unveils that New Zealand's South Island also perfectly fits to the east coast of the Ross Shelf at the same Mid-Atlantic location. And even more telling is that the magnetic signature for this island is right here, nestled beside our original moorings for Antarctica. This precludes this region of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was split right down between these two land masses. This investigation is definitely starting to yield global links. And the more we browse, all the mass under the ocean waves connected to New Zealand, the Campbell Plateau and Chatham Rise, perfectly slide over the Ross Shelf with the Bounty Sea Channel riding up the Rockefeller Mountains here at the end of Antarctica's Executive Committee range. This tearing away is now visible on the surface of the Earth as the Emerald Fracture Zone retraces the shearing path of this great flush. And this region is also perfectly connected in its magnetic signature. Digging deeper, the other side of South New Zealand also has a perfect fit with Australia. And the island chain surrounding the Coral Sea closed back up by wrapping around Australia as well. This totally fits our investigative hypothesis and why this region of the ocean has the highest magnetic signature on the planet. It truly appears to be displaced and overlapped surface mass. Now while investigating Australia closer, it is known that Tasmania originally broke away from the mainland right here, but no cause has ever been discovered for how and why. Yet when we view the magnetic signature back in the South Atlantic Anomaly region, we find Tasmania stretching away signature right here below the New Zealand one. This gives us direct evidence of a connected event, so we need to broaden our search pattern of our investigation. To summarize and refocus, Antarctica's signature and confirmed landmass foundations are right here. The Scotia Plate was once closed and then exploded open, causing the shearing away of Antarctica from South America, which means that South America was slightly east and forced westward in the event. But in order to fit New Zealand, Tasmania, and all Australia, Southern Africa had to be tilted eastward as well. And this is precisely what the World Magnetic Model signature shows, a rapid push westward with Africa popping out of position suddenly. This definitely was applying immense westerly pressure. Now when we take that direct evidence into account, we can see the harmony in why the Andes are bent the way they are. The magnetic signatures confirm a definite land bridge in the south between Africa and South America. And this bridge was rapidly flushed out according to the direct evidence of magnetic signatures and all the under-ocean land formations. Looking closely, the Campbell Plateau, Chatham Rise, New Zealand and Tasmania credibly fit between Australia and the Ross Shelf of Antarctica, especially when the Rhone Shelf was closed prior to the Scotia Plate explosion. With the Rhone closed, the Ross Shelf opened wider and the Executive Committee mountain range was pulled back. This mountain range arced like a pendulum in the explosion. Eruptions began at Shackleton Range, tearing open the tip of Antarctica. This enlarged to form the Scotia Plate, and this motion wedged the Executive Committee range upward into the direction of the Ross Shelf. It is this motion that specifically caused the squeezing out direction of Tasmania from the Australian mainland, and this is directly what the magnetic signature shows. The more the Scotia Plate opened, the more the Executive Committee range wedged and the more Tasmania squeezed away. And this movement continued momentum with the pressure applied from Africa, and this caused what is currently Southwest Australia to crush into the Ross Shelf. And the pressure is so obvious, it even bent Victoria Land away from the Transantarctic Mountains to its current position. The fit was so tight that it could not come apart without a domino causing cascade trigger like the explosion of the Scotia Plate. The direct evidence shows all synchronous bending in this fit and very little erosion, which means it had to have happened rapidly and not too far in the distant past. 
The direction of true motion on a sphere is visible. True three-dimensional motion on a sphere is not like billiard balls rolling on a flat surface. It's not even like the motion on the surface of a cylinder. On a sphere, all directional thrust or movement will flow, bend, and curve with the sphere's surface relative to the size and density of the object in motion. This inescapable reality is precisely what the direct evidence shows, and why Antarctica, Australia, and New Zealand are shaped the way they are, and also why the undersea land masses reside in their current locations. This southern land bridge went through a rapid, gigantic flush into what was formerly the Great Deep. This is not the end of the investigation. Not only did this gigantic flush happen according to the direct evidence, during the process in the current Indian Ocean, we see Madagascar was ripped from its foundations in the same flowing direction. And this large undersea mass, called the Kerguelen Plateau, was also siphoned down to its current location by the swirling force of Antarctica to its South Pole destiny. Since all this is confirmed in the magnetic signature, the speed of the event is evident in Australia's path. It was flung at such a rate, it rode over the Kerguelen Plateau, but not over what is now the French Southern and Antarctic lands. This double direction, crisscrossing motion is something that cannot happen over a slow geologic process, but only during a cataclysmic flush. The shooting out of Australia was so fast, the signatures show a massive crash into what is now the base of the Java Sea. The signatures show the entire South Pacific landmass was once attached to the 90 East Ridge on a true north-south longitude, and it was suddenly bent to its current location. During the process, all the mass on the east of Australia was sprayed out into what is now the Pacific Ocean. It is this collision and motion that created the Ring of Fire, which is where the majority of Earth's volcanoes currently reside. Note specifically that with the land bridge obstruction between Africa and South America, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is definitely revealed as non-existent at one time, which means the deep geologic time measuring stick for Earth's strata layers is invalid. This mandates that every date ever given that is related to time derived from ridge spread as an assumed constant is as incorrect as the Pangaea model itself. Now, although this massive flush and its ensuing crash would be enough to cause the Great Flood, there is still more to investigate to make this a unified and conclusive case. As we investigate the direct evidence in the Northern Hemisphere, when reviewing the Pangaea model, it becomes obvious that the model so fights to retain its east-west spread across the Atlantic that it shows no regard for what its model does in the North or South. And this is why the model is most often shown in a flat two-dimensional manner. It plays around with the scale of continents so much to fill in assumed positions that it disregards the laws of physics. The Pangaea model distorts North America to where the width of northern Canada never changes, contrary to the Canadian shield motion, and the southwest U.S. mountains, along with most of Mexico and Central America, virtually vanish. Asia's vast mass is incorrectly shown as growing to fill in the northern hemisphere because it never moves its specific latitudes extent. Also, the whole east-west across the Atlantic Ocean has no regard for any mass under the ocean waves because the detail we enjoy was not available when the Pangaea model was assumed. Science just ran with the notion and crowned seafloor spread as the motivational force. When matching the up-to-date direct evidence and true three-dimensional motion on a sphere, not only was there a land bridge in the south, but also in the north. This is what the magnetic signatures yield, along with all the fault and rift lines, while completely undoing all Earth's tectonic boundaries. The true continental motion shows that all tectonic boundaries were formed because of the continents separating. Greenland perfectly mates between Canada and the UK at the Hatton Rock Hall Basin, and over here at the Sackville Spur. It once joined mainland Europe and North America. It was perfectly mated to Labrador and Baffin Island not only filled in the Labrador Sea, but also Nunavut was rolled down over capping Hudson Bay. Prior to an isostatic pop, forcing mass over the crest of the North Pole, the mass of Greenland, Baffin Island and Nunavut were hung up on the ridge that eventually formed Iceland. The surrounding region of the Iceland Plateau, under the ocean surface, 
right at Jan Mayan Ridge, shows its clear tearing away from Iceland's west fjords, creating the Jan Mayan Fracture Zone. Because this is how landmass moves on a true sphere when a speedy global event happens. It was torn upwards and pulled easterly, which reveals the motion Europe and Asia were taking in the same process. And the widening of the Norwegian Sea becomes evident. This region slowly bends back to perfectly accept the North American continent, as the tectonic boundaries are completely undone. The Canadian Shield is my backyard, and this vast expanse appears like a partially closed up fan, or similar to cars piling up during a high speed highway collision. This happened as land speedily rode over the crest of Earth's North Pole. Europe and Asia also bent in this similar fashion, following the proper curvature on the surface of a sphere. And this is what our investigative hypothesis was based upon in the US-UK mainfield total intensity map. The higher signatures are condensed and compacted regions of displaced land that better shield magnetism. And when they are returned to their former locations, the Pangea model of plate tectonics is absolutely undone. The Pangea model's east to west separation across the Atlantic simply could not have happened based on the direct evidence. This is also visible in the direction the Alps bend, especially the way the Carpathian Mountains are pulled away from the Austrian Alps. This is synchronous with the direction that Africa is moving in its angled north trajectory, which was crushing the Italian boot and separating the Aegean Sea. The evidence shows that the UK's longest stretch was actually once angled east to west and was pulled or siphoned into its now north-south position. And as all this land was sliding over the North Pole crest, the Arctic Basin was torn open. This investigation needs to maintain focus of true motion on a full sphere, especially when dealing with large and very long masses of land. This is where the scale of a continent aids in revealing the unified forces that moved it. If forces push a large or long mass, the mass is going to bend uniquely on the surface of a sphere and the combined bending itself unlocks the force that pushed it. When the density of mass is factored in, everything becomes evident that no landmass on our planet can move completely random. When viewing the Americas with our investigative hypothesis, magnetic signatures revealed two distinct events, one that visibly predates the other and started the directing motion to our second event. The first event is somewhere in the dateless past at the Chicxulub impact crater. This is one of the largest confirmed impact structures on planet Earth, and most scientists today believe that this is what ended the reign of the dinosaurs roughly 65 million years ago. But remember, their sedimentary dating method is linked to seafloor spread rates at boundary lines as a constant. And top scientists plainly declare in every rendition that at these boundary lines themselves, the rising seafloor ridges, these are the youngest in age and our now superseding investigative hypothesis undoes all these youngest ridges in a single event. But the direct evidence does show two distinct events before these boundary lines fully existed, so I must concede one major event in the dateless past, and that is the Chicxulub impact. Let me show you why. When combing the scene surrounding the Chicxulub crater, the magnetic signatures reveal two other precise matches for this impact both at different depths and spread out over a great distance. These three key points allow us to triangulate the continental motion on a true sphere, consistent with all other global motion. It appears that without this first event, the one single unified continents could have remained gridlocked indefinitely due to its configuration and gravitational balance, but the Chicxulub impact altered this balance. The data reveals the Caribbean islands all pulled back to a unified string. Cuba and Jamaica perfectly fitting into Haiti, and the entire Dominican meets Puerto Rico, and all these islands back up to an original mass, connected with South America, and quite possibly connected with the main continent on its west. And with the resolution now available, it is plain to see that all of Central America rolls over the northern crest of South America, Panama and Costa Rica ride over the Gulf of Venezuela, while Nicaragua and Honduras close the Caribbean Sea with all the landmass connected to their east. 
with his motion is synchronous with the undoing of the Cayman and Puerto Rican trenches. And as these trenches close up, the Yucatan and Belize fold down onto Honduras, and in the process, the entire Gulf of Mexico closes up as it wraps around Florida. This not only raises the Louisiana floodplain and closes the Mississippi Delta, but it places Houston right near Tampa and puts Mexico City just due south of Miami. All this motion closes up what is known as the Bermuda Triangle. At more than 4,200 meters below the ocean surface, in the heart of this anomalous region, is the precise signature of the Chicxulub impact crater. The magnetic signature reveals how deep into the surface this impact penetrated. Not only does this reveal reason for strange happenings in this area, as magnetism from Earth's core disorients and wreaks havoc, it shows the initial geologic stresses that played a factor for complete continental separation. With our third triangulation link, the order of events is uncovered, revealing the two distinct events. In the Caribbean Sea below Puerto Rico, our third magnetic signature matches all the data as a middle layer between the Bermuda Triangle signature at the bottom and the Chicxulub impact signature on the surface. The magnetic signatures show these regions pulled apart in two distinct stages. The middle pulled apart from between the other two somewhere in the date was passed, most likely at the time of the Chicxulub event. The Bermuda Triangle was torn open during a global isostatic pop. This allows us to conclusively mesh North and South America together and account for all the direct evidence. It also shows the precise coordinates where Chicxulub was at the time of its impact and clearly shows that in this configuration, seafloor spread across the Atlantic is absolutely impossible. The length of this combined landmass cannot traverse the curvature of the Earth to ever mate with Africa. When we take into account our Greenland Bridge in the north and its westerly motion, we can visibly see its unified force on Alaska, and this force traveled down the strength of the Rocky Mountains like a rigid spine. The first event in the dateless past, the Chicxulub impact, was so immense that it began separating the Caribbean Sea. And this pressure started the separation of the Greenland Bridge from UK, but that impact had its visible limits. As North America's large mass was hung up due to the once completely joined North Pole, the Chicxulub impact began the pressure for this complete northern bridge to move, and this continued stress on the North Pole. But Alaska and the Rockies could not bend without an eventual massive isostatic pop. This is evident in the direction and flow of the entire Rocky Mountain chain. The Grand Canyon did have ancient beginnings, but prior to the Canadian shield fanning westward, the Grand Canyon was not as grand and was on a different trajectory. The length and strength of the Rocky Mountain chain right up to Alaska is one of the greatest testimonies of this being a unified event. Total global motion is visible in its makeup. When we consider the Yucatan being pulled away from its Bermuda Triangle roots, its swing around Florida tearing open the Gulf of Mexico could only happen with joint pressure from the north on the Rocky Mountain chain and its subsequent swing westward. Due to its length and curvature on a true three-dimensional sphere, the Rockies had to give somewhere, and they gave way at the known geologic hotspot currently underneath Yellowstone, forming the Idaho Valley in the process. And this allowed the westward movement of Mexico along with the southwestern United States. Also, the southern extent of the entire continent and visible westward motion are clear in the magnetic signatures. Also, the magnetic signature records this very visible pop and bend of Alaska out of a hollow on its speedy southwest trajectory. And this is only possible with the spine of the Rockies bending open at Idaho and the simultaneous split of the Cayman Trench westward. It is just proper flow on the surface of a sphere that directional pressures cause unified combined motion. Investigating our global poles should just be review at this point. 
in the direction of continental separation understood to match our investigative hypothesis, which is a model that follows the U.S.-U.K. main field total intensity map, declaring the three dense regions are actually compressed and compacted landmass, raising the level of magnetic shielding from the core, and the lowest region, the South Atlantic anomaly, has actually had land rapidly torn away, leaving less magnetic shielding from Earth's core. Furthermore, that the CCGM's detailed magnetic anomaly map of the world functions similar to an MRI scan of Earth's surface, revealing the continent's true origin contrary to plate tectonic theory, and that the once unified landmass broke up rapidly, causing the vast ocean described as the Great Deep to slosh over the entire land for months and then abate. In this configuration, according to the direct evidence, all plate boundaries are completely undone and were created as a result of this single event and the east-west separation across the Atlantic is impossible. It was always an untested visual notion from prior to today's data, which includes all undersea mass. In the north, a clear Alaskan pop is in sync with three specific geologic folds in the vast Russian landmass, and this is confirmed by what I call the Petrovo twist. This northern fit is so tight that there is little or no erosion, which declares an event in the not-so-distant past. But there was a starting event in the dateless past that caused Greenland to begin its crushing journey up Earth's northern crest. This pressure not only caused the Canadian Shield, but eventually tore open Hudson Bay and continued rapidly, pushing Alaska out of a deep hollow. This is harmonious with Russia's vast mass riding over Earth's pole, twisting and then speedily tearing open these three folds. This motion created the Arctic Basin we have today, but this movement is linked to opposing pressure coming up from the Southern Hemisphere. In the South, there was once such a tight fit that only a cataclysm could separate it. Australia and Antarctica were squeezed between Africa and South America. This is confirmed by every above surface and undersea formation and also the magnetic signatures and this is the geologic origin for the South Atlantic Anomaly. With this northern and southern unified configuration, the ancient Pacific was enormous and truly worthy to be named by scripture as the Great Deep. It is amazing how text that dates back thousands of years left factual geologic clues that could only be discoverable by today's data. Eruption began at Shackleton Range and widened what would become the Scotia Plate, driving the Executive Committee range west by northwestward, which pried Tasmania from its Australian roots, then continued a wedge into what is now New Zealand. This formed the Ross Shelf, and a gigantic flush of more than 22 million square kilometers began. This event was so fast, geologically speaking, that Australia crashed into land that is now the South Pacific. And this was while land in the north could only move simultaneous with this gigantic flush. This is where our evidence examination moves into evidence analysis. This is where all the elements examined so far show their unified structure. This is the basis for this discussion of a single global catastrophe, and I named this investigative hypothesis the jack-in-the-box scenario, because when all the data is combined in harmony, there is a visible planetary isostatic pop. Isostatic rebound, or continental rebound, is a known fact. This is when massive pressure upon a land is moved, and the land underneath rebounds upward with the movement's release. Yet the direct evidence doesn't show a simple rebounding, but a massive pop, and then cascading events that all moved together destructively, but uniformed. Unlike the Pangaea model that has many unconnected and independent motions without any uniform cause. There is the direct evidence for massive ice sheets at one time in the Northern Hemisphere and some have speculated that these ice sheets were between three to four kilometers thick. Just imagine the pressure this could exert onto the land. Now imagine what forces well up from the core of the Earth if such a mass on the surface shuffled slightly. Even a minute movement could disturb Earth's molten mantle, and if this started rebounding and further shuffled the surface mass, where would the cataclysmic cascade end? This is what I mean by a complete isostatic pop over simple rebound. It continued a cascading action globally. 
The rebound was such that the liquid core was disturbed and as it was under immense pressure, the core got involved to balance the earth. This is what our investigative analysis includes. We already know that Earth's circumference at the equator is slightly wider than it is from pole to pole. A full 67 kilometers or 42 miles today. Yet, the direct evidence combined shows that their circumference difference was even broader in the past. Especially if there was the weight of four kilometer thick ice sheets weighing pressure on the northern hemisphere. There does, however, appear to be the signs of oscillation in this circumference over time. This is a three-dimensional factor that plate tectonics does not account for, and why I see the transform faults is primary over the divergent boundaries. It is visibly noticeable on the more dense ocean crust that oscillation accounts for the strike-slip fault fractures. But this motion all factors into an eventual pop in the north and a gigantic flush in the south. All the granitic masses forming the continents show the stresses that contribute to their shapes. The coastlines, mountains, hills, and valleys all tell a tale of the pressures that molded them. The single unified continent of mostly granite cracked apart as the more dense sea floor warped and bulged easier with Earth's mantle in the core. But even the sea floor density has its visible limits as well. The pressure of oscillation between the equator and pole circumference eventually caused the lithosphere to tear open like toothpaste being squeezed out of a tube and the Earth gave way at a region under tremendous pressure. First at Shackleton Range, and then poured out into what is now the Scotia Plate, and this eruption began the cascade of separating all continents in a single cataclysm, which is where gravitational balancing comes into effect. Because just as mass was exploding out from here, all surface mass, according to the laws of physics, would race to the opposite side of the planet. And this is why we have a northern sink or drain that surface mass raised towards. It is all part of proper balancing on a sphere. The core of our planet is where all geologic action begins, and this action works its way to the surface. The notion of only slow and steady deep geologic processes doesn't account for the full force Earth's core can generate. Physics of makeup, temperature, and speed of motion all need consideration. The physics of fluid dynamics is quite advanced today, and knowledge of viscous fluid flows in a spherical shell allow for perfect recreation simulations. The scale and temperature of Earth's makeup is well documented, and it is difficult for most to imagine that the ground we live on can be more volatile than we can cope with. Devastating earthquakes have a way of instilling a sense of helplessness, so much so that the mind blocks out the possibility until it happens. It is in the spherization process that gravity and magnetism interact to create the centrifugal and centripetal motion effects of any planet. All planets are spheres because of motion. How the composite makeup of a planet stays a sphere has to do with the balancing of opposing forces due to motion, or distortion becomes visible. Pressure is magnified immensely with depth, and when this pressure is disturbed, it can violently release outward. The balancing of the sphere is always visible when pressure is placed on one point. And that pressure signature shows its alleviating lift on the opposite side. It cannot escape the train dock. It is simple push and bulge or pressure and lift, and evident no matter how perfect the sphere. The more perfect the sphere, the more the evidence will be in the composite. Nowhere on Earth is this more visible than Antarctica's signature through the core onto the North Pole. It is not random that the bulk of Antarctica's mass, when viewed through the Earth, sits mirrored where no land in the North Pole resides. And viewing down from the North Pole, it is not random that Greenland rests where the Rhone shelf of Antarctica is split open. They are connected in their offsetting mirrored pressure balance, and so is the entire planet connected in the same manner. This is uncanny evidence of the balancing process because it factors into what is possible and what is not, allowing us to actually see what happened. All around the globe is the pressure signature of each continental landmass mirrored to the opposing side, where very little or no continental mass resides. It's just how physics balances, and even the directional flow of continental landmass at any point is matched by the directional flow of the pressure on the opposing side. 
Not only does this balancing flow rewind to our investigative hypothesis, but the precise motions themselves aid the process increasing the speed to these positions. It is simply where the mass is permitted to rest on the surface of a sphere. The core forced all masses to these points. And there are not just a few points of correlation to this forcing, but all points possible correlate to this single unified cataclysmic event. Australia rests here for this reason, and New Zealand stopped here due to northern pressure. And even the direction that South Africa swung westwards factors for the pressure that opened the Aegean Sea. The southeastern bending of Asia and the entire South Pacific reaches its extent of pressure coming through from South America. And even the shaping of Japan has the pressure signature of northern Brazil. North America's footprint is so evident in the Indian Ocean, showing how its motions flow with the movement of India. And eerily from this angle is the way Mexico's Salina Cruz bends to match the Antarctic pressure around Scott Mountains. More than just balancing continental positioning, this uncanny evidence shows that this pressure is also the direct cause of all boundary lift and the seafloor spreading. The unified Pacific Antarctic Ridge and Southwest Indian Ridge perfectly mirror the forces that caused them, and this stems from synchronous movements of Russia and India. It is not by coincidence that this mirrored image also shows the movement of North America and the tearing open of the Aegean Sea, and even the bending of Italy. Moreover, if we clearly understand the mirroring effects, it becomes plain that the trajectory and flight of Australia is the cause for the Mid-Atlantic Ridge rising on the seafloor. Bottom line is that plate boundaries clearly did not exist prior to this motion, as it is the pressures from all directions that push through one side of the planet to any specific point in question. It is how the liquid outer core is squeezed, and then in turn releases that pressure through the mantle on the opposite side of the sphere. In our day and age, we should not be shocked that a volcanic eruption from off the coast in Chile is then followed by earthquakes in Nepal. What resides in the mantle is no longer a question. Not only does this new model show why the mapped water chambers are trapped, during the compositing of this film, after this model's animated map was compiled and finalized, the University of California, Berkeley, released their findings from CT scans of Earth's mantle. It's penetrated 2,800 kilometers deep into the Earth, just above the liquid outer core, and their findings were absolutely shocking. What they conclusively revealed were two immense magma chambers so vast they could only be called super blobs. One rests in and around South Africa, and the other stretches out for thousands of kilometers beneath the Pacific Ocean. They cited this as evidence for a slow geologic process as they animated the rising of Hawaii out of the Pacific. But by the claim's suggestion that these hot spots are stationary, the positions also disproved the Pangaea model by leaving no driving source at tectonic boundary lines. It was then I realized that many claimed scientific computer simulations are only animations of what actually exists with the projected hypothesis added. And if the hypothesis is stuck in the plate tectonic model, that is all they will project and program into their simulation, even if it shoots himself in the foot. But conclusively, all that actually exists from their CT scans are the current hotspots and magma chambers with these two giant super blocks. So I did my own computer simulation with their actual data. And lo and behold, when I attach these super blobs to the motions of my Jack in the Box model, they perfectly show the cause and flow of the events I have described, not somewhat, but perfectly. They show the seepage into the Scotia Plate and the scouring trajectory of Antarctica with its separation points. And also the crushing of Australia and Tasmania's squeeze and the entire formation of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge while pushing westward. And since its scale is without alteration, as we follow it northward in this position, it perfectly shows the magma signatures in the Mediterranean off of Portugal and under Spain. And eerily, it also shows the eastern border of Canada and perfectly cradles where the Greenland Bridge was. 
This precise fit over this immense length cannot be coincidental. It is convection's cause, and the pressures that determine molten lava to rise from Earth's fluid outer core. As this is the source where all the heat is generated for any magma chain. It proves the great isostatic pop, the squeeze on the molten core, and the subsequent breaking up of the continents causing a global flood. To finalize our evidence analysis and completely report all factors of motion that the direct evidence produces, the effects of an isostatic pop not only squeeze out magma from Earth's core in the direction of our model, but the gravitational effects drive everything to how it is precisely laid out according to all genuine data. The direction of Earth's spin is plain in how the sun rises in the east and then sets in the west, and it rotates at a known speed of almost 1,675 kilometers an hour, and this needs to be factored into any model. In a speedy separation of continents due to an isostatic pop, the gravity is going to affect the motion uniquely from everything else, and it will confirm or disprove the entire event. If there was an enormous isostatic pop in the north, there will be evidence of gravitational unwinding in the north, synchronous with a balance in the south. This is like the loosening or tightening of a nut and bolt, where, due to the direction of threading, when tightening or loosening a nut and bolt, both are moving in the same direction at the surface, clockwise or counterclockwise. But in their mirrored image, they are always moving in opposite directions, which reveals the tightening or loosening based upon the thread direction. Now, due to Earth's rotation direction, the Earth is a left-hand thread or reverse thread, which means its circumference at the equator will bulge when it is tightened, and the circumference at the poles will rise when loosened. During a northern isostatic pop, the loosening effect should be visible in the surface direction of motion. It should move in an unwinding pattern, which is opposite to its rotation in space. And this is precisely what our investigative hypothesis has shown. As the gravitational unwinding happens during an isostatic pop, the direction of motion for Greenland and Canada are opposite to Earth's rotation. And when the Arctic Basin and Russia cross over the crest of the North Pole, they get caught in the gravitational rotation which aids the speed, thus bending Alaska. And we see the opposite of this in the southern hemisphere. Here, the giant flush is actually aided by the 1675 kilometer an hour rotation of the planet, and this is where we see the balancing flow in action. When we flip the Earth over, we see that Antarctica's flight to the South Pole and the Australia crash were rapidly torn by the aid of Earth's spin. This empirical rotation and its speed factors into this cataclysm. When we think of the devastation caused by the 2004 tsunami, where nearly a quarter million people perished, and this tsunami was due to a single undersea tremor, tiny by comparison to the scale we've discussed. By all evidence, there once was a unified continent, a single piece of dry land, the world that was. This continental configuration was so tight that there was no way it could have ever come apart in a slow manner. In order for the continents to separate into their current shapes, and with the now known undersea formations and all the geologic data and the laws of physics, the Earth bears the direct evidence of a massive one-time isostatic pop. That eruptions began, and enormous clouds formed, followed by torrential rains. And as the Scotia Plate exploded open, the continents began their rapid separation. And on that day, all the tsunamis of the Great Deep burst forth, overtaking the land, and that this motion continued for months and months and months. And the ocean water sloshed, encircling the globe over and over and over, and it finally began to abate. The fingerprints of the flood are everywhere. I know the preservation of God Almighty's inspiration still remains in holy writ, and his inspiration continues to this day. So did the Great Flood really happen? Well, if you live on this planet, it most certainly did. Thank you.